But what I can tell you is that I have alongside building a real estate portfolio, I also run three businesses. And now this gives me some time to make some reorganization and reprioritize some of the business because I'm not on a plane every 10 days. This is Brandon Turner, and you are listening to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. Welcome to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. Are you trying to get out of debt? invest or just not sure where to start then this is the place for you we discuss different ways to get out of the rat race and build your wealth join us on this wild ride to financial freedom hey welcome back to the average show finances podcast i'm your host mike cavagioni and today's guest is sarah weaver so sarah i'm super excited to have you on the show thank you so much for joining me today Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I want to start this off the same way I start every podcast episode. We hit it off a bit off camera. Really funny story about military challenge coins, right? So I think it's pretty cool to know a little bit about that. But if you could please share with my audience, if you could tell us who you are, what your story is, who's Sarah Weaver? Absolutely. Yeah, Mike, it's really fun talking to you because I don't have any military connections. I have not been in the military, never been married to anyone in the military. However, I have lived in Germany, South Korea. I've traveled all over the world. So I often get asked if I'm military. And so I pointed out some of your challenge coins that you have there in the background because I've just had cool experiences with running into military people around the world and been given some pretty cool challenge coins, especially considering that I'm not related to military. And I think that's what makes my story really interesting is that I've been traveling full-time, fully nomadic for four years. Actually, my four-year anniversary was this week. And so it's pretty wild. I left. Thank you. I left just like my family thinking this is a phase I need to get it out of my system, quote unquote, and thought I'd be gone, I don't know, six months, maybe nine months. And here I am four years later, still homeless. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that's awesome. And what a way to call it or describe it as being homeless, right? Okay, so you've been homeless, quote unquote, for the past four years, but you're traveling the world and there's no place that you really have laid down your roots, right? You've completely uplifted them and... You're all over the place. So how does somebody do that? Like, how did you get to this point where you could just travel around for four years and not have to worry about it? Absolutely. So four years ago, I was working for a US-based company that said I could live anywhere. And so if anyone's doing math, that was before COVID. I actually got that job in 2015. And so I've been a remote worker for almost eight years now. And so that was priority number one. So just like any goal, we're of course going to talk about real estate investing. And anytime I tell people like if they are looking to invest or make a change in their life, they have to first know where they're going. And so I knew where I was going at the beginning. I wanted a remote job. So I made that a priority. I got a remote job. And then I, funny enough, bought a rental property. Um, I bought it as my primary. I lived in it for a short amount of time, but I always knew or bought it with the intention that I knew I was going to turn it into a rental property. And so that really gave me the security that I probably craved. People probably look at me and think, oh, this girl's crazy. She doesn't need any security. But financially, I wanted security. And so I got those two things. I had a rental property that gave me passive income. At the time, it was about $500 a month in passive income. And that was after CapEx and maintenance and being quite conservative of an investor. So that was a great property or purchase. And then the second thing I had was a job. And Monday through Friday, eight to five, I worked for the man, but I was able to do it from anywhere. So bought a one-way ticket to Argentina and four years later, I'm still traveling. Awesome. Definitely not in Argentina anymore now. Where are you at right now? Today is a little less exotic. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. Because for those watching on video, I annihilated my arm. I broke my arm, my elbow and all three arm bones, tore all the ligaments and got to fly to Omaha. This happened in Guatemala. And I had to fly to Omaha, Nebraska for my surgery because my health insurance is tied to a rental property that I own. 
So a disclaimer to out-of-state investors, be careful what your primary is, because when an accident happens, you could end up having to live there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I have to ask now, what the heck happened in Guatemala <laughs> that you destroyed you know, your arm like that? Mike, I was saving children, taking care of kittens, being a good citizen, and I just fell. Like, I wish uh, it was a cool, it's not a cool story, except that I was in Guatemala. Maybe that's interesting. It definitely made flying back to the U.S. really interesting. But yeah, it's grounded me for a little bit and it's helped me realign what I want this next chapter of nomadic life to look like. Sure. So actually, let's actually dive right into that. What does the next chapter look like? Because now you got a chance to sit here and like you said, kind of realign yourself and it's the beginning of the year, right? This is when everybody sets their goals, sets up their new vision board, figures out what they want to do for the year. So good timing. It sucks that it happened, but good timing that it happened when it did happen. What's like the next phase looking like for you, Sarah? Yeah, great question. So fast forward from that first rental property to now, I now own 19 units in four states. They're all in the Midwest. They're Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska. I buy small multifamily. And I specialize in what I call the medium-term rental strategy. So just like a short-term rental, my units are furnished. But instead of renting them for two days or three-day stays, I'm renting them for 30 days or more. And so I like that strategy because it allows me to have tenants in there for 90 days. It means less turnover, but still more money than a long-term rental. Funny because now I'm in Omaha, I own eight rental properties or like rental units here. And I'm such a good real estate investor that they're all occupied. So I can't even stay in my own dang unit, <laughs> which has caused some logistical confusion. But I love the positive spin that you've taken on this because I agree with you. It's really interesting timing. I've been nomadic for four years and there's been whispers of me wanting to slow down and put down roots. There's a beauty in routine and having community and living in one place. And I think I've been craving that on and off, even probably the entire four years that I've been nomadic. And that yearning has gotten a little bit stronger. And it's a little too early to say, I don't like it when people are like, bad things happen for a reason why you're like in mourning, because I think I'm still in mourning. But I can say with confidence that it's interesting that I had to break all the bones in my arm to actually slow down. <laughs> and so to be honest, I think it's a little too early to say yet what's going to happen. But what I can tell you is that I have alongside building a real estate portfolio, I also run three businesses. And now this gives me some time to make some reorganization and reprioritize some of the business because I'm not on a plane every 10 days. And so I'm really excited to see what comes from this quarter business-wise. Awesome. Yeah, because now you're in one place, you can kind of really sit down and focus on that. However, that actually brings me to the next question I want to ask you is over the last four years being completely no nomadic, you went from having that first property, right? When you decided that this was the route you were going to go to now you're at 19 units, right? And you have three businesses and you did this while you were traveling around and being nomadic. So I have to ask you because here I am, I'm sitting in one place out here in Hawaii and I love it here, right? But sometimes I find myself struggling with, okay, how am I going to figure out what the next step is for A, B, C, and D? And I'm in one place. So how the heck were you doing this while moving around? Yeah, it's not perfect. So one of the things that I've really embraced the last, probably the last two years was done is better than perfect. So if you guys get anything out of this episode, I hope that you really hear me when I say done is better than perfect. And here's what I mean by that. It doesn't mean be sloppy because no one's going to buy your services or invest with you or sign up for what you're selling if it's messy. But it doesn't have to be perfect. So what I mean by that is I found a problem that investors were having and I created a solution for it and it did not involve a logo or a website or even a company name. And so what I mean by that is I own a company. It's now called Aria Design Services and that's A-R-Y-A. And what we do is we 
furnish rentals for investors. So many people that have furnished rentals are like the boxes and the furniture put together and the, how do you do this, Sarah? Because you're an out-of-state investor. And I was like, let me show you how I do it. And then that became a business. And so I was serving clients way before I had a website, an EIN number, and a logo. And that's how I did it. There are things behind the curtain or behind the scenes that you guys are really messy. But I provide an incredible service to my client. And then what happens when you do that and you have fantastic follow-up, you get testimonials and then you get exposure and then you get more clients and then you get referrals. And next thing I knew, I had a full-fledged business that didn't even have a name. That's awesome. It's, hey, how do I take care of this problem? You need to talk to Sarah. Oh, what's the name of her business? You just need to talk to Sarah. There you yes. go. And, no, that's and, awesome. And you just treat people really well. Next thing you know, like people want to use your services because you provide excellent service. And so that's what I focused on. Like picking up my phone mattered more than creating a perfect landing page. And so when you ask the question, like, how did I do it? How did I grow from three units to 19 units and build businesses while traveling full time, it's I focused on the things that really mattered. And then the rest eh, didn't like quite get done. <laughs> yeah, no, picking up the phone is important. It's funny. Actually, somebody literally said this to me the other day when I answered my phone. And they said, it's really nice that as a real estate agent, you actually pick up your phone because other people that I call don't even answer their phone. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Sometimes I can't always answer the phone, but yeah, if I have the opportunity, I can pick it up. I'm going to pick up the phone every time that I can, unless I'm yeah. sitting in the movie theater. That'd be rude. But <laughs> it's just something simple as that. Customer service goes such a long way. And I really appreciate what you're sharing about that because I think that's a side that a lot of people don't really focus too much on. They're like, yeah, that'll come with it, right? Customer service. But see, you're putting that customer service aspect first. You're you're concentrating on the actual service that you provide to get those good testimonials, to get the people talking about you, right? Recommending you to other people. And that carries so much more weight because again, you were able to put this business together and build an entire business without a name, logo, website, nothing. It was just based on word of mouth. Like that type of grassroots movement is almost unstoppable. Well done on that because that's, and I'm glad that you focused on the customer service aspect first because a lot of people don't. They focus on everything else. I need to have my website. I've done this myself too. I was like, I need to have my website. I need to have my logo. I need to have everything done, right? And then you focus on the service later. So it's just a great mentality to have. Well, and then what's nice about focusing on client acquisitions is then you have money in the bank and then you can pay someone to do the logo or the website or all those other things that frankly are not my specialty. And so that's really how I did it. And then I want to be fully transparent with your listeners. There are parts of my life that just get ignored. My health isn't the best or my dating life is non-existent. And so sometimes you're crushing it in some areas of your life. And then there's other buckets or parts of the wheel, however you want to look at it, that are like, eh, little empty or half full. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And that's something that you're able to reflect on right now while you're mourning your arm and, <laughs> and getting healed up. So that's good though, that you actually have that, you need other buckets that you need to work on and stuff. And I appreciate your transparency, right? A lot of people just talk about, oh, here's all the good stuff. Here's all the good stuff. They don't talk about the crap that's left behind. And there's always yeah. crap that's left behind that you got to clean up, right? Always. Otherwise it just, it piles up and you become a hoarder right? And we yeah. don't want that to happen. No, that's, I really genuinely appreciate the transparency. So for my listeners right now, you guys can see here, Sarah is just a genuine person, guys. So this is fantastic. Now you, you started off, you got 19 rentals. Now, what made you decide to go with the medium term rental strategy instead of maybe just regular monthly rentals or I'm sorry, yearly rentals or the short-term rentals? What made you decide on medium term? Absolutely. The first thing first is that half of my portfolio is long-term and half of my portfolio is medium-term. So I really believe in diversification. For me, I love the medium-term rental strategy because let me just actually let the numbers speak for it. So I own a fourplex in Omaha, Nebraska of all places, and a one-bedroom, one-bath long-term is $800. So I have a tenant in one of my units is 
still long term and she has a pet so it it rounds up to 850 so 850 a month long term great tenant i've actually she's her lease came up and now she's month to month i think she's great i'm probably going to let her stay in there as long as she wants then the unit next door in the same building i should say same setup exactly identical but i furnished it i rent it for 1875 dollars a month a month <laughs> So yes, I pay utilities and utilities are never more than, I don't know, 275 per unit. Never. They're about 100, 150 per unit. Then you have, you, don't get me wrong, then you have snow removal and all these things. But even if it was long-term, the whole building was long-term, I would be still in charge of snow removal because it's multifamily. And so the numbers were the number one driver in the medium-term rental strategy or even just the furnished rental. So then I get a lot of STR hosts asking, okay, but what are the numbers if it was a short term? Meaning I allowed less than 30 days. In the summer, it is higher. One month, I got 2,400, but I don't think we'll see that again. One month, I got 2,200. And I'm on average still at maybe 1975. So let's just call it a hundred bucks more. But then you have to coordinate with your cleaners. And yes, everything's automated. I'm using hospitable but I'm still like, it's taking up what I call mind space because I'm like, oh, did that cleaner go? Did the unit get ready? Is this happening? There's just a lot other things that go on for an extra hundred bucks, man, not worth it for where I'm at in my life. 27 year old Sarah probably would have been like, yeah, more work, more money. I'm in, but I'm at a place in my life where I'm like, I want less involvement and less interaction, which is what why I love the medium term rental strategy, because here's the best part. I have a tenant move in and then you might hear from them the first couple of days. Like just yesterday, there was a problem with the parking. A new girl moved in and she parked badly, caused some parking drama. Super nice message back right away. Apologize. We got it fitted out. Probably for the next 80 days of her stay, probably not going to have any issues, right? Not going to hear from her. Whereas if I had a new tenant move in, in every two or three days, that could be a constant. Now, of course, I'm going to have an automated message go to them explaining how to park for dummies. But what I'm saying is that with the medium-term rental strategy, you don't hear from them for at least 70 days. And I love that. And you're getting more money than a long-term rental. Yeah. No, you know what I think I appreciate the most about what you said was closer to the beginning when you were talking about the mental space that it takes up, right? The having to constantly worry about, okay, did the cleaners make it out there? Did this happen? Did, did we? Did I get the snow removal done on time before somebody's going to complain? And yeah, that's a big deal because that time f- for the extra hundred dollars, right? The amount of time that you have to put and the actual thinking you have to do that's required to make sure that those things are happening, you get to free up so much of that's worth that hundred dollars going away, right? You're, it's almost like you're paying to get some of that time back. And that's well, super important. Well, and speaking of paying for time, now that I have 19 units, I do pay. So I have a virtual assistant, I have an operations manager. And so all of that extra admin time literally costs me money because now I'm paying an assistant to handle the things that I no longer want to deal with. And that costs money. And so if they're going to spend four extra hours a month, that negates the extra $100 of income. And it was truly a business decision to switch from short-term rental to medium-term rental. And then in addition, it was also seasonal. So $2,200 a month in the summer, I like that. I do often do what I call a hybrid model where I I change and I allow a couple of those units to become short-term rentals in the summer, especially during the College World Series, which is in Omaha, Nebraska. However, come September, even October, November, December, definitely January, dead on STR. Like no one's coming to hang out in my one-bedroom apartment on a Tuesday in January. It's 20 degrees here. And so it's better for me to fill it with a traveling nurse through the entire winter, my tenant, Shelly, she just extended another three months. And I did a happy dance because now I have that unit 100% occupied for six months at $1,875.
Yeah, that is something you just can't beat that. And the fact that it's a lot more secure, right? So you're feeling a lot more comfortable because when you lock somebody in, you don't have to worry about, oh, they're just here for a couple of days and am I going to be able to fill it next week, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about that. It, you're good for the next 90 days. So that's exactly. awesome. And then you have you have these repeat offenders, right? So you have somebody that just renewed for another 90 days. That's awesome. I know that's fantastic. And then I guess the other thing too is the turnover, right? There's a lot less turnover. So you're not having to worry about, like you said, the cleaners and all that other stuff. But another thing that I really appreciate that you were talking about is paying for your time, right? For the admin task and thing, things like that. I do the same thing. I have a VA. She's fantastic. Like my podcast and everything else that I'm doing wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for my amazing virtual assistant. And I know she's going to hear this because she works on all my <laughs> podcast episodes too. So Zane, you're awesome. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. But that really does change the game for people. So I really appreciate when I hear other people talking about that, outsourcing some of those tasks. It's And yes, it's the things that you don't want to do, but at the same time, it's not about that you don't want to do it. It's the amount of time that you have to put into it for something mm -hmm. that's so kind of like tedious. And sometimes you feel like, oh, I'd rather work on the things that are $1,000 an hour versus these $10 an hour tasks. And I could pay somebody to do that. Yes. Yeah, that and is I, fantastic. And I think that there's a lot of blockage for new investors because sure. they're like, oh, like I only have $100 a month in cash flow. So I can't afford or justify. I always like to use the word justify. I can't justify a virtual assistant. But what I like to challenge your listeners is if you hired a $7 an hour virtual assistant to take X, Y, and Z off your plate, would you pick up another property in the next 90 days or even in the next 180 days? And if the answer is yes, then hire a virtual assistant. You don't have to hire a full-time employee. You can hire people even by project basis, like on upwork.com or whatever it may be. And so I cannot urge people enough to hire a virtual assistant. Hey everyone, Mike with Average Joe Finances. The Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, aka RubeCon, is on for 2023. It'll be May 4th through the 6th in Phoenix, Arizona at the Sheraton Downtown. I'll be speaking again this year and I want to see you there. This year I'm doing two speaking events, one about growing your investor network through podcasting and the other is about investing while in the military. We have some great speakers lined up so you don't want to miss this conference. Visit Average joefinances.com slash rubcon r-e-w-b-c-o-n or the link in the notes below and use promo code mike for discounted tickets see you there what's going on everybody so today i want to talk to you about wealth tender if you are a finance content creator whether that's a blog a podcast you're a financial advisor or a financial coach i highly recommend you check out wealth tender Wealth Tender is building a database of all the top finance blogs, podcasts, and the financial advisors and financial coaches that they have on there are vetted and top notch. So we actually had the pleasure of hosting Brian Thorpe, the CEO and founder of Wealth Tender, on Average Joe Finance's podcast episode 25. Go check out that episode, listen to his story, and listen to him talk about the database that he's building. It's really phenomenal stuff. So if you're interested in checking out the directory, or if you're a finance content creator and you're interested in joining up with the directory, go to the link below in the show notes or check out www.averagejoefinances.com slash wealth tender. Let's get back to today's episode. Yeah, Upwork is actually a fantastic place to find a VA. And my recommendation for anybody that's listening is to create the job that you want and then let them apply to it and come to you. And then you vet them that way. I made the mistake of finding my own VA the first time. And remember, I said mistake. It was a mistake. I got this advice from a couple other podcasters and real estate investors that I know. And they said, Mike, create the job, let them apply, and then vet them that way. And I did. And that's when I found my amazing VA that I have now. And uh, yeah, you, you can't, you can go wrong that way, but you got to vet them, right? You got to make sure you ask the right questions and you're going to find somebody that's ready to grow with you. So I think that's important. And the other thing too, is like when I initially hired them, it was for my podcast and my podcast wasn't making money at the time. Like when I hired an editing team, my podcast wasn't monetized at the time. And I said, you know what? And I was trying to justify in my head as to why I shouldn't do it. 
And I was like, no, you know what? It's the time. I need the time back. I can't spend all this time editing. I can't do this anymore. So when I hired the editing team, that's when I figured out different ways to get my podcasts out there, more on social media, get more listeners, and then eventually get a sponsorship, get monetized. And I'm like, oh, look, now the podcast is paying it for paying for itself and paying for the editing team. This is fantastic. But you had to, but you had to bet on yourself at the beginning. I, I, I did, yeah. And I like that. I like the way you phrase that. You got you have to bet on yourself, right? You have to be confident in your own ability to what you're trying to do next. Oh, Sarah, I love that, man. That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> So now you've got these midterm rentals, that's the strategy you do. And then in the summertime, you bust it down to short-term rentals because the you can do it then, right? Yep. Uh, now, and then the other ones are long-term. Now, do you find that provides like a stability in case you have a longer turnover period or anything like that? If you were to go vacant in, let's say, 60% of your medium-term rentals, would your long-term rental sustain you through that process? Yeah, great question. So yes, what I love about how I've set up my portfolio is that some of the reason that my long-term rentals are long-term rentals is because they cash flow so well that I don't want to put in the effort to, even though I own a furnishing company, I don't want to put in the effort into furnishing that house. It, it already cash flows $800 a month. And so I'm happy with that. And I'd rather go buy another unit then invest the time and energy into stopping what I'm doing and furnishing the place and then having yet another unit that's a furnished rental when it functions so well as a long-term rental. And and all most anything that I do now in 2023 is all tied back to what I want my life to look like. And so I like my portfolio because half of it is sit it and forget it long-term rentals. And then I have a few where I have amazing tenants that will probably renew year after year after year. I'm so grateful for those long-term rentals. And they cash flow fantastically because I bought well. I have low PITI. And now I'm in a place where I want to build something bigger. So now I'm looking at larger apartment complexes, maybe even syndications, doing capital raising. And I'm doing other things because that ties well to what I'm doing. Do I want to own 100 furnished rentals? Not today, because I don't have the infrastructure. I don't have the full-time employee that could manage 100 furnished rentals right now. And I sure as heck don't want to take property management back. That is not the thing that fuels me. That is not the thing that lights me up. And so I don't want to take back property management anytime soon. No, I love that. I just love the way your whole perspective on this is, it's like, I'm not going to grow unless I'm at that point where I'm ready to grow and I have that infrastructure put in place because you, you've already been there, right? And you had the other business start up and then you had to figure it out as you went along. So you've already been in those shoes, right? Which yeah. was a good problem for you to have. But at the same time, it's kind of, okay, I don't want to get stuck to the point where now I'm having to manage this stuff myself again, because it, it seems, I know you're talking about how you might want to settle down and all that stuff, but if I feel like that nomadic like lifestyle still in the back of your brain. And you're just like, I don't want to be tied to anything. Yeah. So that's awesome. Absolutely. And actually I, I'd like to touch on that a little bit because I know we talked a little bit about this before we hit the record button, but you have two other businesses besides the home furnishing business. So can you touch on those two a little bit? Absolutely. So I have a coaching program. It's called the mentorship. And that really is what it is. I want to act as a mentor to investors who are drawn to this idea of investing out of state they don't have to be committed to furnished rentals or the medium-term rental strategy because I've already said I have half of long-term and half of medium-term. But I attract a lot of investors who are really drawn to the idea of building a lifestyle for themselves. And out-of-state investing is the answer for a lot of us. A lot of us live in expensive markets, yourself included, where out-of-state investing or long-distance investing is just the way forward. And then I attract a lot of investors who want to be nomadic. It doesn't have to be for four years at a time. Some of them are nomadic, taking a month here and a month there. But a lot of people in my mentorship program want to invest out of state and they just don't know how. So inside the program, I'm teaching them how to build an out of state team that usually starts with an investor friendly agent. I'm teaching them how to even pick a market that can feel really overwhelming and create what people like to call analysis paralysis. 
And so those are the type of investors that I serve inside the mentorship program. We meet almost every Tuesday and it's just a really cool community because one thing that you've probably already noticed about me is I'm really big on mindset, like really big on there's still feelings and emotions involved in investing, whether we like it or not. And often the only reason you don't have a portfolio as big as you want is you're the problem. Uh, wow. Okay. I feel like there's some fingers pointing at me right now. I'm the problem. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, that's great. And I believe in coaching and mentorship. I talk about this a lot with, so I also do coaching, right? I do financial coaching, right? And this is something I talk about with my clients as well. Having that person that you can go to that can back you up, point you in the right direction when you're not sure about something is very reassuring. I have a coach. I'm a real estate agent. I have a coach to help me as a real estate agent, I think it's super important that I have somebody that kind of holds me accountable and says, Hey, Mike, you know, don't do that. Like you're messing up over here. Or, hey, maybe focus your time on this because I do. I have a bunch of things going on. I have my podcast. I also invest in real estate. I'm a real estate agent. I just started a new business doing inflatable nightclubs out here in Hawaii. So that's crazy too. So I do need like people just guiding me saying, Hey, bro, come on back to the over here and let's get this figured out. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I love networking and meeting people in my niche and that will help help me because we all help each other. And that's one of the things that I love about the real estate investing community is that, man, like once you get out to these networking events and you meet some of these people, it's just, it's amazing. Like I've made lifetime friends just from conferences and networking events that I've been to because there's so many good people that are so willing to give. And I think that's awesome. Anyway, I'm talking no, too much. I'm from no, New York. No, no, Mike, I, I love it because you've touched on such a good point, which brings me to the next business that I own. Yes, that's um, what I so want to I'm, get into. So I'm sure that there's a lot of investors listening who are thinking, okay, good for you, Mike. You found lifelong friends, but <laughs> here I am and no one in my family wants to hear me talk about investing. I'm lonely or I know I'm not crazy, but yet my friends call me a slumlord. Like I know you have listeners out there who are feeling like that. And for a lot of them, the conference scene is not the best way to build lifelong friends. And so what I designed was, again, I started with the problem. The problem was people were craving community and connection. And the solution is these really cool small scale events. So I own a company now called Invested Adventures. By the way, we did five events before the company ever had a name. <laughs> so comment yeah, below. That, if you that's the, the Sarah name. Weaver way. Yeah. And so what Investors at Adventures does is it takes real estate investors on epic adventures. Like we're not going to Branson, no offense to anyone that owns rental properties in Branson. We're going to African Safari in Tanzania, the south of Italy to see olive orchard that a real estate investor bought for $25,000. We are going to hike the W Trek in Chile down in Patagonia, a goal setting retreat in Guatemala really epic adventures. And for those of you that just can't give yourself permission to take time off, they're a business write-off. Like this is a business trip. So I've developed these usually 11 to 17 people. So let's just call them 15 person events. And that is exactly what I love that you touched on is talk about lifelong friends. When you hike a 14,000 foot volcano with someone in the real estate space, shared trauma, and then you come down from the mountain and you not only know them as a person, but you also know about their investing strategy, how they financed it, where they're going. Maybe they gave you a hard money lender contact, but more importantly, you're connected to them on a personal level. Yeah, that's fantastic. It, it, that reminds me of serving in the military. And it's just like when you're in those tough situations and you've got those people that are by your side that you have to like begrudgingly get through it together, you start to really develop like really strong relationships with those people. And that's why we call each other brothers and sisters in the military, right? Because we've all gone through some type of really tough event together that will really bring out like the grit in somebody, right? And show you somebody's true character, right? When you're out there and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And you have somebody kind of pulling you along. Come on, we're all going to do this together. That really carries so much more weight than saying, I sat next to this person at a conference and we took notes together and shared a latte. Or we met in the hallway and then we got drunk at a bar. And it, yeah, don't get me yeah. wrong, love conferences. Conferences are the reunion to those smaller events or those deeper connections. 
Yeah. But I think it's an it's a cocktail. Like you need to have the conferences and the small level events. And of course, I'm going to advocate for coaching. Of course, my mentorship is via Zoom. And I think you need that in-person connection with people. People are craving it. And so I'm excited that I can give that to people. 100%, especially after the last couple of years, that in-person connection is just so much more meaningful. Yes. So the last three years have not been fair to anybody. So it's very nice. Well, except that. for me, I have to brag. I fled to New Zealand four days before they shut their borders. And for those of you that did not follow the news correctly, the correct information was that they closed their borders. So I got stuck in New Zealand and there was no, there were no COVID cases. And so I'm not going to get into a COVID conversation, but what was really cool at the time, while the world was scrambling, figuring out what to do, New Zealand just shut down and then, frankly, we partied. So we needed your inflatable nightclubs because uh, we just had a there, really there good is, time. There is one in New Zealand, actually. <laughs> I, I've been chatting with them a lot on Instagram. We've been sharing <laughs> ideas with each other. They're awesome. Oh, I'm sad I missed it. Or maybe yeah, I was yeah. there and I don't remember. I had that good of a time. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. That's no, awesome. All right. Hey, Sarah, we really covered a lot of stuff in this interview. So thank you so much for that. I would like to transition this into something that I call the final round. It's where I'm going to ask you the same four questions I ask everybody that comes on this show. The gritty questions to find out how Sarah is under pressure, which I think we all know how this is going to go because you're going to crush it. (laughs) Just don't break your arm. I'm joking. I'm joking. (laughs) But okay, if you're ready to go, we'll get this party started. Let's do it. Okay. Not a party like New Zealand party, a party that we can have together here. So first question, Sarah, is what is the biggest mistake you've ever made in real estate? Oof. The biggest mistake I made was trusting a contractor because I was being lazy and I didn't want to spend money on having someone check in and confirm that he had done what he said he had done. And instead I was like, yes, I did it. Check that box off, send him payment, moving on to the next thing. And then of course, tenant moves in, find out that contractor didn't do things correctly. And then good luck chasing someone after you've already paid them. Yeah. Oh man, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's a doozy. And I think I've only had one other person bring that up as one of the biggest mistakes they've made is dealing with the contractor. So I definitely appreciate that. Speaking of that, I know you've probably learned a lot of lessons. So this kind of ties into that next question. And that is, what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started this? I think we touched on it, the hiring piece. I wish I would have hired, I wish I would have, I'll use my own words. I wish I would have bet on myself and hired a full-time assistant six months earlier. And I'm sure even if I could sit down with that version of Sarah, she would have still been like, nope, (laughs) because there's still some scarcity mindset work that I'm doing around money. And hire an employee before you're profitable, like what you did, it's really ballsy. And I would go back and I would do it. I would have bet on myself and hired someone six months earlier. I now have two full-time employees, a contractor helping with marketing, a contractor helping with social media. Another contractor is about to start next Monday to help with more property management. And I'm so glad I bet on myself and my business now. I wish I had done it six months earlier. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great lesson learned. But at the same time, it happened at the right time for you. With where you were in life, I'm a firm believer in that the things happen to us for a reason, right? And that's what develops our character. So that's one of the things that built you into who you are today that makes you even stronger, right? That if you would have done that back then, and it's almost, it's like the cheat code, right? Would you even be where you're at right now if you cheated to get it that way back then? Right. Yeah. So, that's no, that's that's fantastic. But it is a great way to look at it. Like, hey, should have bet on myself. And for my listeners, that is something that's huge. And I and I really like that term that you use. That's what I'm going to use every time now when I talk about something like this. Is just you need to bet on yourself. And I'll say, hey, I stole that from Sarah Weaver because she's awesome. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you. All right. Hey, the next question I have for this, and again, this kind of ties into it. But speaking of your coaching and mentorship and you're helping people out, right? Do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started in this space today? Absolutely. Find a mentor who is two steps ahead of you. 
I think a lot of people find a mentor. It's easier because they have bigger platforms. It's who, a mentor who is 10 steps ahead or heck, even 50 steps ahead. The challenge with that, and I still think you should do that. The challenge is that the person with 1200 units doesn't remember the emotions that you're going through when you have zero to 10. And so finding someone who's two steps ahead of you is really crucial in addition to finding someone that's further along. And so typically you can find that also for free. So it's creating your own accountability group or reaching out to say, hey, I've been following you on Instagram. Can we set up a call? And then really just pouring value back into that person, but find a mentor who's two steps ahead or even 10 steps ahead, rather than always finding someone who's 50 to 100 steps ahead of you. Sarah, 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 Sarah. I absolutely love that answer because this is something I talk to people about networking all the time, right? And it's one of the things that I speak about often. And I always tell people, look, when you go to a conference or a networking event, don't go out there just passing out your business card, just trying to meet as many people as you can. Find one or two people and really connect with them. And then the other thing I say too, is I recommend if you're first, if you're just getting started out and you want to learn and you want somebody to kind of take you under their wing, don't find the person that's been doing this for 20 plus years, because back when they started, things were way different. There were different programs. There were different ways to get funding and lending. It was a totally different scene. Find the person that started a year or two ago. That's kind of new, still green, right? But they started, right? And they're making moves, right? Find out what they did to get started and just start having those conversations, right? I feel that's, I absolutely love your answer, right? I think that is so huge. Find the person that's two steps ahead of you. Don't find the person that's been doing this for forever, right? That's like a brand new person going up to like Brandon Turner and saying, hey, can you teach me real estate? He's dude, come on, man. And um, he's like way past that. Well, and it's like, you have to respect their, so think about where you're going. I want to be, I don't actually, cause I'm obsessed with starting businesses, but let's just call it like laying on the beach, doing nothing. Don't come up to me when I'm still in hand, laying on the beach, doing nothing and ask for five hours a week of my time. Whereas someone that's two, like two steps ahead of you, they're probably in the grind, excited to talk about where they are, how they got there. Whereas that person that's been doing this for 20 years, hopefully they're like in retirement mode Yeah. or so asking for their time is also setting yourself up a little bit more for rejection than someone that's two steps ahead of you. And 100%. I always, I am very open about how many units I own and how much cash flow I have because I'm probably not a hundred steps ahead of you. However, there's probably a piece of my life or my business that you're like, dang, I want Sarah to teach me how to do that. And that's why I started the mentorship program. It's not because I think, oh, I'm amazing now I own this many units. No, you guys, I'm probably still two to five steps ahead of you. Sorry, I was on mute there. That's a great point. It's the fact that people that are still you know, early on, not necessarily early on, but they're still like in the grind, like you said, right? They're hungry. And people that are hungry are always willing to give back and share, you know, some of what they're eating with other people because they're like, hey, come along with me. Because it does, that camaraderie, that those relationships that you build is so important. Those are the people that are going to say, hey, you should come on this next trip to, we're going to go to Machu Picchu. It's things like that. And you start to build that community. And then you never know, that person is going to be your partner in the future, right? Or somebody else yeah. is, you know, you're going to meet somebody else during that process that you guys are going to partner up and start taking down some big deals together, right? And then before you know it, you're the person that's a couple steps ahead. And you've got people coming to you saying, hey, how are you doing this? And you can say, hey. Yes. Come on, let me show you. This is what I did two years ago when I first started. And I'm so glad you mentioned that, Mike, because that's exactly what happens. Actually, I call it something. I call it the after effect. So I, my events are amazing and I love the after effect. So I have two people from my trip from last year. They're taking down a large scale, huge down to the studs kind of renovation. And then someone else in that same group from the same event is their private lender. That's awesome. That's you get that from finding, seeking out mentors and building these relationships. So I love that. Okay. That's enough on that. We could, oh man, we could talk about that stuff all day. I do have one <laughs> more question for the final round that we got to get to. And that is Sarah, this one's more opinion based, but it's, do you have a favorite business investing or real estate related book or podcast or both? 
Great question. I love business books. So really recommend anything from Dan and Chip Heath. They have a book called Switch. They have so many good business books. And the reason I say that is you're probably, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably already listening to the other real estate things. And sometimes you go outside of real estate into the business world and you learn something that you're like, oh, yes, I'm going to apply that to business. And so really love any book by Dan and Chip Heath. They're brothers, they're scientists, they're educators, really, really good books. And then my favorite book is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. I basically read that in my 20s and changed my whole life. That's awesome. Great recommendations. I have not read Switch, though. I wrote that one down, so I'm going to add that to my list. So definitely appreciate that. The business books, like you said, right, it, those are things that you could take as a real estate investor and apply it to your real estate business to become more efficient, right? Yes. So. Absolutely love that. Sarah, that is it for the final round. You survived. You made it. That is it. That is the end. However, I do have one more question for you. And this is the most important question of this entire podcast because my listeners are saying, wow, Sarah's over here dropping the knowledge. Like, I absolutely love her energy. I love what she's talking about. I want to know more about her. I might be interested in her coaching program. I might be interested in going on one of those awesome, amazing trips that she does. So where can people find more information about you? Do you have a website you could share with us? Social media, anything like that? Absolutely. My website is sarahdweaver.com. And you can also please reach out to me on Instagram. If you are listening to this, you like anything I said, you didn't like anything I said, would love to hear from you. Also, my Instagram is sarahdweaver. Fantastic. That is actually how we connected as well on Instagram. So I definitely appreciate talking with you there, getting this set up because this was awesome. And again, I truly appreciate this conversation that we had. I love your energy. You're just an amazing person. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on my show and to chat with me and my listeners today. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, to my listeners right now, um, so I'm going to put all that information down in the show notes. I'm going to make that easy for you guys to copy and paste, click away. Just don't do it while you're driving. Okay. But I want to say to you all, thank you so much for joining me and our special guest, Sarah Weaver on the Average Joe Finances podcast. Go leave us a five-star review and tell us what you liked about today's specific episode with Sarah. Aloha from Hawaii and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances Podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances Podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. Thanks for listening to the Average Joe Finances Podcast, your source for beating debt saving money and investing. Learn more at AverageJoeFinances.com.